We all agree that our children mean more than anything else in the world to us. But what would you do if someone hurt your child? What if, short of killing them, they hurt your child in the worst possible way? If you had the opportunity, what would you do to the person responsible? In 1983, the world witnessed what one father would do in that very situation. Hero or murderer? You decide. This is the case of Gary Cloche. thanks for joining me today if you are new to my channel i release my crime content on a wednesday and a sunday so if you like crime content and consistency then this is the channel for you all of you are subbing me on my patreon channel just be aware that i'm going to be starting doing some videos soon i'm trying to up my content there and a big shout out to all you youtube community members thank you so much for all your support but everybody who comes here even if you're just watching my content you're supporting me and i appreciate it if you haven't subscribed please do so you get a little reminder, ideally, if you get notifications on that I've released my content and also get involved with the chat because it's great reading your comments. Today's case is one that I wanted to cover because those of you who do know me already, you know how I feel about children being protected. It's something I've spent a great deal of my life working within and as a parent, it's something that I live on a daily level, literally. My Achilles heel in life are my children. Whatever they need, I want to create possibilities for. And the idea that anyone could hurt them is something that on occasion has kept me up at night. So today's case is gonna explore, I would imagine what one could say is the commitment of a parent and whether that commitment can ever go too far. I'll be so interested in your thoughts. Leon Gary Plochet, he was better known as Gary. He was born on the 10th of November, 1945. So he was a native of Baton Rouge. A little bit of info there. I actually spent quite a lot of time in Baton Rouge a good few years ago. Yeah, I went over traveling and New Orleans and it is an interesting area, but one that is unusual as far as the States go because I can say I actually did spend time there. So Baton Rouge is a capital of Louisiana on the Mississippi River and Gary attended Istroma Senior High School and after he graduated he also studied at Louisiana State University. He then went on to join the United States Air Force. He did well, became a staff sergeant and then after he left the Air Force he worked with heavy equipment as a heavy equipment salesman in Baton Rouge. He was a law-abiding citizen gonna put it out there. He was considered a pretty good guy. So Gary later gets married. He marries June and they have three sons and a daughter. That's including a boy called Jody who was born in 1973. Now Gary and June later separate, that's in August 1983, but it's not a challenging familial situation. They get on. They are in a scenario where as much as the relationship is broken down, Gary remains a really loving and a really protective father. Now, even when Gary first had his children and would speak to his friends about his feelings towards his children, one of the recollections that friends and family remember about him was that he would say, if anyone touched my kid, I'd kill them. You may have watched videos where, I don't know, somebody might have said that as well, maybe me. But I think it's very common for us parents to visualize, conceptualize, imagine our worst nightmares coming true and somebody harming our kid and us wanting retribution. Like in the Old Testament type of retribution way. So arguably lots of parents imagine this because we are so connected emotionally to our children that anybody who caused them any harm, 
we would want to cause them pain for doing so. Now, Jody, his son, he heard his father say this, and he said that even though he was young when he first heard his father suggesting that he would end the life of somebody should they harm their child, he believed that his father meant it. He believed that it was a commitment as opposed to just some suggestion that was said out of fear or out of an imagined experience. He believed, no, actually Gary was the kind of father who would go ahead and do it. But he was a law-abiding citizen, so he had a completely clean record. This was not a man who was involved in violent escapades. He was not a hardened criminal. There was no evidence in his background that he was the kind of human being that would cause another human being, for any reason, harm. In fact, he lived a really regular, quiet life. And when people described the character of Gary, they described him as a loyal friend. And he was funny. He used to make people laugh. He was known as a friendly, amiable guy. He even coached Little League Baseball, which to me just sounds so all-American. You know, it really does. And when you think about his history, being in the forces, working decent jobs, bringing up his kids, getting on with his ex and having a family bond, even though the family unit had broken down to some degree, and the fact that he's coaching Little League Baseball, arguably, there are no red flags right now in this man's background. But this all changes in March 1984. Because something happens that doesn't just affect Gary and his life and his family's life. It literally divides a nation. To some people, from this point on, he'd be a criminal. To many others, he became a national hero. In 1983, Jody was 10. His little boy was 10. He's taking karate lessons with his two brothers and they had an instructor and that instructor was 25 year old Jeffrey Dose. Dose had been raised in a deprived area of Port Arthur, Texas. So they'd struggled financially when he was a child. Also, he was one of seven children. So when you think the economic impact of having lots of siblings when you're already relatively economically troubled as a family, that's gonna mean less than families who have only one or two children would have in their lives. But also, attentionally, because you're dealing with poverty and you've got lots of siblings, it may be that you don't get the undivided attention of your caregivers as you may wish to have. But these are things that may be balanced out by the fact that you have lots of brothers and sisters that make your life fun. And also, you learn to be a little bit more resilient, per se. So, arguably, it doesn't mean that his life wouldn't have been good, albeit that it was deprived. His father was a service station owner, and when Desai was a child, one of the things that was very traumatic for him was that his sister died from a rattlesnake bite, and we can all imagine the kind of trauma of losing a sibling and the impact that that would have on you, and it's a really traumatic way to lose a sister, isn't it? The idea that she goes out one day and she gets bitten by a snake and she dies. Also, Doucet said that he was molested several times as a child, but his parents say that they only knew of one incident. I would imagine that if he's saying that he was abused several times as a child, he's telling the truth. The parents may only know of one incident, but I think we can all agree that it's a very difficult subject for children to talk about. And if they are aware that he was molested even on one occasion, and they can validate verify that that occurred on that one occasion, then arguably he will have been molested many times. He drops out of school in ninth grade. This is around 14, but it seems like he's had quite a lot of dysfunction and he's dealt with sexual abuse. So it would not be unusual for a child to lose their education at some point because they're dealing with a whole host of psychological issues and emotional pain. But one of the things that was striking about this man is that he really did believe that he was destined for greatness. He was somebody who really felt that he was going to make it big. I mean, in fairness, he did to some degree make it big, but not necessarily for the right reasons. To say it was an ex-Marine, so obviously somebody who'd been in the services and had achieved a certain level of physical fitness and integrity. I mean, it's no easy feat to become a Marine. But at the time that we're talking about, he's actually an ex 
marine. He's not working anymore in the area. He's now a carpet fitter and he works with his brother. He also ran the Desai Hapkido school. So he taught a Korean style of karate. And what he'd do was he'd take teams of boys on the road to tournaments all over the country. And he had this big dream. And that big dream was that he was gonna launch them on the national circuit. To be fair, he obviously was quite committed to this. It does feel like he wanted to get those boys out on the road doing martial arts. He wanted to see them succeed. And that dream that he had of getting them on the map when it came down to them winning national circuit competitions, you can see that there was a devotion there. One of the things that he had to do, because he had to finance the tournament tours, he would sell mugs, he would sell clothing, he would sell all of this merchandise to sporting fans. And he would even get his kids who he trained to actually promote the merchandise. So they'd be wearing them and they'd be promoting them that way. But even though that sounds really good on one level, and we're thinking, well, Dosse is somebody who is trying hard. He's obviously raising these boys up. He's sacrificing finances to some degree to ensure that they succeed. Didn't go quite to plan. Ultimately, he gets accused of fraud. So what he's very good at is taking people's money and being like, of course you can have 20 mugs. Yes, you shall have three hoodies. Of course, you shall take 15 t-shirts. Can I have the money? There's the money. I'm not sending them you. That's what he did. So he'd take the cash and then he wouldn't actually send them the goods. So automatically we're seeing the con artist within him. And whenever we're looking at potential antisocial personalities, these are certainly the red flags. These are the things that we look at and say, well, that is not what a typical human person would do. We wouldn't. It doesn't sit right with the average person to steal from anybody. Certainly not when you're stealing by selling goods that literally advertises your brand, which means that there is a direct link to you being the individual who's conning those people. I mean, it's not like he's some faceless individual that people are buying things from. This literally is his brand. So again, he has really poor boundaries. He's not a good consequential thinker. So he's certainly not the person that people believe he is. And this is why, as far as I'm concerned, Dosse is somebody that people are fooled by. This includes Jodie's mum. So June was in a situation where she's wanting her children to excel. Every parent wants them to do well at something. My own child is a Thai boxer. And the fact that they really believe that he's going to be successful in the area you kind of vicariously believe that somehow you're the reasoning behind it. It's like, I have never done Thai boxing in my life, but my son is like considered somebody who's going to be a champion. So I think that makes me a champion. I think that basically I'm, I'm the champion, aren't I? I'm the champion Thai boxer. That is how a lot of parents are in their mentality, right? So she's really thrilled because her son Jody wins a trophy at a tournament and she's thinking to herself, wow, this kid's got some opportunities, some abilities, and I want to foster these. And she's so enthralled by this scenario that she ends up speaking to a reporter at the time and she says, you know, Dessay's training has really, really helped my son. You know, at the end of the day, he's somebody who has made an impact on my child's life and I can see his confidence growing. And one of the children, Jordan, he'd actually been a slow learner. He'd been considered to have poor coordination and karate training really improved his balance it really improved his athleticism and a lot of parents will talk about the fact that when they get their children who may have been struggling with bullying or as was just noted then issues with coordination confidence all of those things and they take them to martial arts self-defense they see a real improvement Firstly, because it changes the mental state of that child. They start believing in themselves. They start believing that they have the capacity to do things like defend their feelings, defend themselves physically in a way that they didn't have before. And they also start to be able to use certain areas of the brain that 
requires physicality to be connected. So therefore, the more physical you are, the more areas of your brain are being stimulated that wouldn't ordinarily be stimulated. And thereby, the neural connections and all of the things that are important within our physiology regarding coordination and motivation and just generally being more fit and more able come together and collude to create a child that feels far more at peace with who they are. So it makes sense that he is making a positive impact on these child's lives. One of the says that students actually said this, we learn discipline, we have better manners, we look up at Jeff a lot. He tells us to treat adults with respect, so we do. He tells us not to fight with our parents, he's my best friend. I mean, that is a very strong supported sentiment about this man. But there's some interesting areas within it, such as saying that he tells us to treat adults with respect. Now, on one hand, absolutely, children ideally and teenagers ideally should treat adults with respect, but only if the adult deserves respect. We shouldn't just carte blanche teach children to respect adults. Actually, there are a lot of adults who don't deserve it, and there are a lot of adults that children should question because their motives behind the relationships that they have with them are very, very questionable. So even though on one level we can say, oh, he's trying to teach them great etiquette and he's trying to teach them to respect their elders, if there is something sinister within that motivation, we can draw out that idea of, well, if an adult says this is the right thing to do, I should do it. And arguably, that's terrible advice in lots of circumstances. Without a doubt, very few people, if any, who knew Dusse actually knew the real man. Because allegedly, I'm going to use the word allegedly for a reason, just stay with me on this. Allegedly, he was a predatory paedophile. Now, I'm saying allegedly because there was never actually a trial. And when you don't stand trial, you can't be found guilty. But I want you guys to make up your own minds about his innocence or his guilt. Personally, I think that Dosse was a really dangerous child sex offender. I think he was teaching children to treat adults with respect because it assisted his MO. You know, he was in a position of authority, so he was in a position where people felt that they had to do what he said. And also, he surrounded himself with perfect activities that placed him amongst children. And not just that he was placed among children, he was seen as a mentor, as was just talked about. He was seen as a best friend. The kids even considered him an ally, somebody that they connected with on a friendship level, which is not appropriate. When you're an older man and you're with young boys, your job is to be the adult, not to be the friend. So he's already breaking down barriers by making those children feel like he is in a relationship with them that is of equal nature. It isn't ever gonna be that way. When you're an adult, you always have the power. Also, the fact that he was teaching martial arts because he had a particular predilection, as far as I'm concerned, his attraction base was for young boys and teaching martial arts gave him an entry point to meet those young boys because martial arts back then when we're talking about it was mostly inhabited by young boys. So this was a perfect place where he could abuse his position and he could abuse the trust of his students and their parents. And we'll never actually know how many young boys Dusse sexually assaulted. But what we do know is that he began sexually abusing Jody, And that started one day when Dusse basically asked, which of my students wanted to learn to drive? I mean, I'm the kid in that class that would have had like all my arms or my legs up. I'd have just been like, oh, I want to learn to drive. I'm nine. What could possibly go wrong? And at the end of the day, I would have been so excited by the proposition that I'm going to get behind the wheels of a car that you can bet your bottom dollar. I'd have been going off with any random stranger to do that because a lot of kids feel that connection with possibilities and just getting to be a grown-up for a few hours. So of course, when Dosse offers this opportunity, who wants to learn to drive? Jody is immediately volunteering. And for many of us who grew up at a certain time, I'm not so sure that parents do this anymore. I may have done this with my kids, but when I was a kid, my dad would put me in his lap in the car and I would steer. It was a time that I remember as golden. I'm sure it's highly illegal. 
I know it's highly illegal, but what I'm saying is I can genuinely look back at those moments in time where I was steering his car down the road, feeling just so chuffed because I was behind the wheel of his Ford Cortina. Like I said, obviously, probably a parenting fail 101, but it's something that I also did with my own children in certain areas where it was quiet. And I genuinely look back now and think, I'm kind of glad that I did that stuff. But as a parent, it's very different because they're your child sitting in your lap. But it's not quite the same if there's some random guy, albeit you know them, taking your child in their car, sitting them on their lap and letting them drive illegally. Parents shouldn't do it either. I admit it, you know, when my kids were young, probably shouldn't have done it. My dad probably shouldn't have done it with me but at least we are connected by blood and family. And the reality is we have the best interests, albeit a little bit scary when you look back at what could have happened, but we had the best interests of the relationship with our child at hand. But this guy shouldn't be doing that. It's an overstepping of boundaries. Like, okay, parents shouldn't do it. But the point is he has nothing to do with that child aside from teaching him. So letting him sit on his lap to steer his car is just outside of an appropriate boundary. Also, one of the things that Desai did was, as you'll imagine when you're trying to groom a child, is that he placed his hands in Jody's lap. Now, even though he isn't doing anything in that moment that's inappropriate, aside from allowing a child to sit on his lap and drive his car, Jody felt uncomfortable. He just felt like it wasn't normal and it didn't feel right. And this is all about, thus say, testing boundaries. This is what paedophiles do. They create scenarios which can push the child just a little bit further every time. And it's a very confusing state for a child because they trust you and they seem to be experiencing a nice relationship with you but you just keep making them feel like the relationship is going into a territory that they're not quite sure of, but they don't want to let you down. And you're not at that moment in time doing anything that stands out as wrong sexually. But by the time that they push you over that boundary into a place where it becomes sexual contact, you feel that you have this strong alliance with them, that you're in a relationship with them. Not a sexual relationship, but a relationship of meaning. And you don't want to let them down. You don't want to betray them. You don't want to tell anybody about them. You don't want to hurt them. You don't want to cause them harm. Imagine how conflicting that is for every child who's ever been in a scenario like this. And that's what predators do. They push boundaries. They keep doing it to a place where the child is in such a state of confusion and loyalty that their actions can occur because that child doesn't know who to tell, how to tell anyone, and most importantly, doesn't want to let that person down. So they remain silent often. So Jody then gets special treatment, shall we say. So after karate classes, he would send all the other kids away, but it'd keep Jody back. And this is when he'd take him to the back room. Now, Jody hated this. He didn't enjoy what was happening to him at all. And at the same time, he struggles with his alliance with this man. So he ends up trying to avoid training sessions. But Jose is not accepting this. So he would turn up at his home and he'd take him to lessons. I mean, that's terrifying for a child, isn't it? There's no escape. And it's one of those scenarios where a parent will often believe that the child is lucky. Here we have Dosse turning up, being willing to escort Jody to the lessons so he doesn't miss them, you know, because he believes in them. And his mother's thinking, this is great. He's got a great trainer. And this trainer knows best. She has no idea whatsoever what's going on at the time. She has no idea what's happening to Jody. Because even though she was unaware that this was playing out anyway, Jodie wasn't telling her that there was anything significantly wrong. In fact, around the time that this was happening, Jodie told a reporter in reference to this abuser, he's our best friend and we don't get into trouble at school. That shows the conflict, doesn't it? He's not wanting to portray Dose in any other way than positively. Now, Jodie later stated, I think one of the things people really don't understand is why I didn't tell. 
when I was 10. Two, what was happening? I knew it would upset my parents. Three, at the time, I didn't want him to get into trouble. It was easier for me to keep quiet and shut up than to upset everybody. So common. What he's just said is so common. This is what children who are abused talk about constantly. It's not that they are compliant in the situation. It's simply that they are in a scenario where they do not know which way to turn. They feel that they're going to let down or hurt somebody, whatever they do. So they suffer by themselves. It's also worth noting that Jodie's own father thought really highly of Dossay. In fact, Gary had previously worked as a cameraman for the local TV station. And he was so taken with Dossay and the impact that he was having on the children and his commitment to the martial arts and just placing the kids on the map, so to speak, in this way, that he even arranged to get Dossay and his students on air. So he's behind him at this point, but not for long. His opinion of Dossay, it changes. So when Gary and June split up, Dossay starts visiting the family home and he starts doing this on a frequent basis, gives the boys lots of attention especially Jody. Also, he starts getting involved by training them in military fitness and getting them in these exercise regimes. Now, of course, June, the mother in this case, is grateful. She's seeing that he's helping her kids at a really difficult time. It's difficult when you have a breakdown in a relationship and a parent isn't necessarily around as they were prior to the breakup. So she starts seeing him as a friend. You know, he's providing emotional support for her. But the reality is, there's literally nothing altruistic about this man's behaviour. Dossay has just seen the departure of the boy's father and an opportunity to just get closer to his victim. We see this with predators all the time. Statistically, the chances of you meeting a predator, a child predator, after the breakup of a relationship when you have kids is staggeringly high. It really is. These individuals are seeking out opportunities to exploit those avenues, to meet people who might be emotionally vulnerable, financially vulnerable, and have children. And then they sweep in, acting like they are the most charming, helpful human beings ever. But all they are doing is grooming the parents so that they can have access to the child. Now, according to one official who became involved in this case, June and Dossay's relationship actually went further than platonic. She allegedly began an intimate relationship with him following the split from Gary. This again is absolute typical behaviour of paedophilic sexual predators. Begin a relationship with the parent of the victim. It means that you've got a constant opportunity to offend. It also means that the person that you're seeing will often have a positive bias about you and therefore give you more access than they would give any other adult to those children. But it seems that even June became concerned about the amount of time Jody was spending with him. So she noted that Jody had stopped all of the sporting interests, all he did was karate and nothing else. And the fact that there is an out of balance relationship where Jody is concerned to the other siblings, that is gonna again be a red flag, but not one to the degree that at that moment in time, she's gonna believe has sinister intent. Very few people ever want to imagine that they have brought a wolf into the home. People wanna believe that they know what's best for their kids. And so if they've introduced somebody to the home, often they will completely refuse to acknowledge or accept the reality that this individual could be a malevolent force within the household. Now, as time passes, Gary's opinion, which is already sliding, because understandably, he's feeling like this man is overstepping a lot of boundaries, spending a lot of time with his biological children, and to some degree, I would imagine, feeling a little bit like his place has been taken. So his opinion of Darcy is just rapidly declining. He's watching him spend more and more time with his family, and what's even more worrying for him is he starts hearing these rumours. He starts hearing rumours about Darcy. One of the fathers actually commented that he was glad that he had a daughter with Dossay about. So he's actually intonating that he doesn't feel that Dossay is trusted around boys. 
And this is worrying because whilst of course rumours exist and they're not always true, I think these kind of rumours are often based in people seeing things that are inappropriate occurring. They might not be able to put their finger exactly on what's occurring, but they see that there is something different about the way that that person interacts with these children versus how they interact with those children. So they've already picked out that the way he is with boys is questionable. Also, another parent had had a son in Dase's karate class, but then they remove him because they say that he starts acting strangely and that change in the behaviour is enough to make them say, I don't want him attending those classes. Now, the abuse of Jody continues and it culminates in February 1984. So Sunday, 19th of February 1984, this is at the time where Dose thinks that he might be arrested for fraud. Remember what I said earlier on about him, you know, selling stuff, just not delivering it. Just, I'll take your cash. You're not going to get anything, but it'll be fine. No one will know, even though it directly links you to me. Obviously not the greatest con artist, but nonetheless, it's catching up with him. So he thinks he's going to get arrested and he really doesn't want to be. And he knows that with all these dodgy business practices catching up with him, there's going to be a scenario where he is going to be brought to justice because already there's actually a warrant out for him. And this provokes something in him. He has a fear that he's not going to get to see Jodie again. And he, remember, Jodie at this point has become a big obsession for him. He's managed to be such a predator around this child that he started to get what he wants from the relationship. Bear in mind, Dosse will have a completely distorted perspective of the type of relationship that he's engaged in with Jodie. He won't see this as non-consensual child abuse. He will be buying into it in a different way, building up a perspective that means that he is just in a consenting relationship. This is what these horrible paedophiles do. So, he now wants to remove Jody from his home so that he can accompany him as he tries to evade capture. So that morning he picks Jody up at his home and he tells his mother they'll be home in 15 minutes. So of course she's gonna let him go. He actually tells her that he wants to show Jody some carpet that is laying. Now bear in mind, up until this point, Jody hasn't told his mother that something untoward is occurring. June may have felt that the time that they're spending together is a little bit OTT, but she's not necessarily got any reason to disbelieve that he is going to just go and show Jodie this carpet. Also, it's what he does. He's a carpet fitter. It's contextual. But the reality is that Dosé just disappears with Jodie. So according to Dosé, he actually asks Jodie if he wants to go to California with him. Jodie said he did. Dosé is pleased by this. He said, he didn't want people thinking that he'd taken Jodie. Not being funny, he'd taken a minor without permission from his mother or his father. That means that you are essentially abducting him. There is no permission base that a child who can't consent can give you. But nonetheless, this is his mindset. So then they end up traveling from one side of the country to the other, east to west coast. And they do this by catching a bus from Port Arthur, Texas to Los Angeles. Does say, shaves his beard on the way. So he's starting to try to manipulate his appearance so that people don't know who he is. He also dyed Jodie's blonde hair black. I mean, this sounds like an innocent man, doesn't it? We can all agree. At the end of the day, if you have nothing to hide, you're gonna shave off your beard and dye a kid's hair a different color. So he knows what he's doing is absolutely inappropriate. They then check into a motel in Anaheim, and that's in California, and it's here that he starts to subject his child captive, essentially, to sexual assaults. Imagine how Jody would be feeling in this moment in time. He is away from his family, he doesn't have any capacity to remove himself, he's no money, so he's now trapped. And this is with a man that he cares for, that he has a loving relationship as far as seeing him as a mentor goes, but he's now totally abusing that trust and Jodie must have been completely blindsided and scared and isolated and really concerned about how the hell he's gonna get out of this scenario. And he's a kid, remember, he's a young kid. This is outside the realms of reality for him. And 
I would imagine all the while he just doesn't know how on earth to manage this psychologically, emotionally, physically, and also familiarly, because now he hasn't got his family around him. June, of course, willingly let her son go with Dose. So she actually believes that he is going to come back. She trusts Dose. But four days go by and there isn't any sign. Now, with respect, I don't get this. <gasps> Sorry, I'm sure June was a great mum. But at the end of the day, you've got your kid who is meant to be going off for 15 minutes with the karate instructor. He's been gone four days and you think it's going to be fine. I mean, at this point, after an hour, I would be like, where is my child? After a night, I'd be like, my child has been taken. I would have been informing the police actually hours after that occurred because of the fact that I believe that there is something untoward happened, whether it's an accident or whether this person is a child predator. I certainly wouldn't leave it four days. She allows this time to pass. And then she ultimately pages Gary and she tells him that Jody's gone. Gary is horrified. So he seeks a kidnapping warrant because as far as he's concerned, his child's being kidnapped. The FBI get alerted and there's this nationwide police search that's soon underway, they take it very, very seriously. But they don't have a clue where Darcy has taken Jody. We're talking about America here. It's really hard to get your head around it when you're in the UK you know, I live in England and our country, you can literally drive from one end to the other in a day. It's the same when I lived in Australia. It's so different. You know, you're talking ridiculous amount of time to get from one side of the country, like say Darwin over to Sydney. You know, I've done that drive and let me tell you, it takes a lot more than a few days. So we're in a scenario where the police in America obviously don't know where they've gone and it's huge. So it's a needle in a haystack operation. He can be anywhere in the country. So we get to a week after Jodie's disappearance and June actually receives a call from Dose. Now at this point, he tells her to bring the other children. He wants her to meet him where they'd filmed Hill Street Blues. Bit weird, not gonna lie. Now all I have is the theme tune of Hill Street Blues playing in my mind. Gonna be honest, in the 80s, there were a lot of kids who knew how to play and only play that tune on the piano. It's a cultural thing. The time has gone now. But nonetheless, obviously it's a notable place and they're like, let's meet there. Now, there are a few things about this. First of all, how bodacious is his mindset that he thinks that this woman whose child he has basically removed from her care and has just disappeared with, is going to be agreeing to meeting you with her other kids. I mean, that is outside the realms of understanding because he is literally now the aggressor in this situation. And even if June felt some kind of compassion towards him, why would she think about trusting her children with him when he's already proven himself to be somebody that she can't trust. Now he says to her, don't alert the authorities because if you want to see Jodie again, you can't let them know. Now it, again, the fact that he feels comfortable threatening her, he's clearly somebody who has a plan and doesn't want anybody to interfere or interject with that plan per se. But even at this point, you can see that June isn't likely thinking that this man is dangerous. You know, the fact that she's engaging with him in any way, shape or form without screaming blue murder and threatening him with everything possible, including voodoo, should he not return her child, demonstrates that he's still manipulating her. The actual break that's required, well, that comes in the case when Dose actually allows Jody to make a reverse charge call to his mother. June, of course, at this point, knows that she has to do something to ensure that her child is safely returned. So she asks the operator for details of where the call originated from. For those of you who don't even know what a reverse charge call is, because people will be like, what is this magic? What is this reverse charge call? That sounds like somebody else pays for my calls. How can I create this in my life? Back in the day, when I was a kid, we had landlines and we had, you know, the phones that you could use out there in the streets, phone boxes. 
and they don't tend to exist anymore either, do they? But you'd have the opportunity to actually call 100 in the UK, that would be the operator, and you'd be able to like ask the person who you were calling to actually pay for the call if you didn't have cash. So arguably it was a way of speaking to somebody when you were struggling. And this is exactly what happens, but it also means that the operator can trace exactly where that call has come from because they are the person connecting you. So she's able to advise that room 38 at the Samoa Motel Anaheim in California is where the call had come from. Authorities as well at that moment in time had also managed to trace the call. So now local law enforcement and the FBI come together straight away. They raid the hotel and they're able to apprehend Dursay. Now he does surrender without any resistance. He's not fighting them. He's not threatening them. He's not threatening Jody either. And I think this really describes why child sexual molestation is so unbelievably confusing and conflicting for a child. Because in that moment where essentially Jody's kidnapper is being arrested, Jody allegedly begs them to let him stay with Dose. It just shows you the extent of these predators, how they manipulate and groom the victims, how they confuse the victims to believe that they need to be on their perpetrator's side. This is why it's so devastating when children are abused. It's also why I'm disgusted by the attempt of those, shall we say, in certain powers to rebrand paedophile child molesters as maps, minor attractive persons. You are not a minor attractive person. You are a child molester and you deserve to be treated with the stigma that child molesters deserve to be treated with because it is grotesque and wrong. Anyway, I digress a little bit there, but this is what they do to children. And I've seen the impact time and time again on children and also on adults who are survivors of child sexual molestation. As I said, one of the things that Dose has done is he's described Josie's appearance. And the whole premise of this is he decided that he was gonna start trying to pass him off as his son because he was making plans to go elsewhere. Now, fortunately, because of the local law enforcement and FBI getting him, they were able to prevent them disappearing further. And they managed to make arrangements to extradite him back to Louisiana so that he can face charges and trial. Also, at this point, Joji, of course, is taken back to his home. He's reunited with his parents. Dosse is indicted for aggravated kidnapping. Now, he'd later claim all he'd done was simply taken Jody so he could pressure June to join him, which is a ludicrous thing to say. I'm gonna steal your kid, basically kidnap them. And the whole premise of this is it's so that you come and join me in a relationship. I mean, that is not going to work ever. You know, in the dating book 101, you're not gonna have a scenario where it's like, oh, what you really wanna do if you want a relationship to become really committed, if you really want to connect with your partner and make them feel emotionally safe, steal their child and threaten them that if you don't join them, they'll never see them again. I mean, like ever, but that's what he says. Now, according to the investigators who interviewed him, Dose ultimately changed his story and he did confess. At this point, he admits that he abducted and sexually abused Jody. He also went on to talk about the fact that he abused other boys as well. And one could say, okay, well, how do we know that that really happened in the way that we're being told? Because we know that often interrogators can pressure people to say that they did things that they may not have done, but they physically examined Jody. And when they did that, it apparently confirmed that he had been raped. So they could tell from his injuries that he'd been repeatedly sodomized, which is harrowing to imagine that child was dealing with that on a regular basis. Remember, Jody idolized him. Dose knew that. He'd taken advantage of it. And then he just used him as a sex object, essentially you know, a boy that he could change the colour of hair-wise, a boy that he could use as collateral, apparently, in his relationships, just a thing that he could use to his advantage. And that's what these predators do. When the authorities actually tell June and Gary that their son has been sexually violated, they're just horrified. I mean, Gary 
even goes and speaks to reporters and he talks about just the level of helplessness that he feels that this should not have happened to his child that he couldn't protect his son this was a man that he trusted his son too so now there's that culpability that sense of i am part of this problem now as i've mentioned at this point in time gary and june are getting divorced he's no longer living in the marital home and even though it's amicable, she doesn't know what he's doing day in and day out because clearly they are separated. And he has a lot of really good friends. And some of these good friends are in pretty high places. So he's good mates with officers who are high ranking police officers in Baton Rouge. And because of this, he's able to figure out what day to say is going to be arriving at Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport. He finds out that he's going to be there on the 16th of March, he's going to be on the American Airlines flight 595 from Dallas. We get to Friday, 16th of March, 1984, the fateful day. It's early evening. Gary travels to the airport. When he's there, he has a coffee and a beer. This is in the airport bar and he's just waiting. At the airport, as you'll understand, this is a big deal. A kid has been kidnapped, abused. The man's being extradited and brought back to the local area to stand to the charges. So the local TV station, WBRZ TV, had actually sent a news crew to film his arrival. And Gary actually goes over to one of these crew, speaks to them, and he's able to establish what time Dossier's plane was landing. And it turns out it's going to be 9.08 p.m. It's approximately 9.30 p.m. At this point, Dussay is wearing a red top and blue trousers and he's being led in handcuffs by the police officers through the airport. They walk past a bank of pay telephones and this is where the local news were videotaping. At that moment, when all this is going on, and obviously people are busy, all eyes are on Dussay and the officers, no one could have imagined what was about to be captured. Well, I say no one, there is one person who did know what was going to happen. Gary. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And soon the whole world would. Because you know when I said that he said to people that he would kill anyone who touched his kid? He wasn't kidding. As far as he was concerned, someone had touched his kid in the worst possible way. And he wasn't going to wait for the slow turning wheels of the justice system to dole out the appropriate punishment. I don't believe for one minute that Gary believed the punishment would fit the crime. Now everyone is so focused on Dossier and his entourage. No one's paying attention to the man in the striped polo shirt. He's just using one of the telephones. Nothing unusual about that. It's Gary. And yeah, he is on the phone. He's on the phone to one of his best friends, Jimmy. And Jimmy actually later said that Gary had disclosed his plan to him and he was unsuccessfully attempting to dissuade him. Gary's in disguise. He's wearing sunglasses. He's got a baseball cap on. So he's not standing out. He's not notable to anybody that this is an individual who could cause anybody else harm in that moment. What they don't realise is that he's got a 38 snub nose revolver in his right boot and he's waiting for the right moment to strike. As 25-year-old Dose walks past with his police escorts, Gary's still speaking to his friend on the phone and he says, here he comes, you're about to hear a shot. Then still holding the telephone receiver in his left hand, he turns. He quickly reaches into his boot. He raises the gun and he levels it at the side of Dossé's head. He's utterly oblivious, of course. Dossé's just concentrating on walking through the airport, aware of all the hubbub around him being filmed and people obviously having feelings about the crime that he's been involved in. So he's just fully concentrating on what's playing out in front of him. The last thing that Gary's friend hears before the receiver is slammed down is a gunshot. Gary had fired a single gunshot from just three feet away. Hollow point bullet entered close 
to Dose's right ear and into the brain. Now, a gunshot in the space that we're talking about, that confined space, it is deafening. Dosse's body immediately crumples to the ground. He ends up laying on his side. He's got blood pouring from his head wound. One of the police officers is heard shouting, damn it. Two officers then rush the gunman and then they pin him against the bank of telephones. One of the officers instantly recognises him and shouts, Gary, why? Why, Gary? Gary's quickly disarmed and restrained. Bear in mind, Gary has done what he came to do. He's not going to fight. And what he says when he's asked, why, Gary? He says to the officers, if somebody did it to your kid, you'd do it too. Another officer, meanwhile, they're crouching down over Dosse and he can be heard stating he's dead. It's that evening that June hears on the news that an unidentified man has shot Dosse at the airport and she immediately knows it's Gary. She immediately knows he's responsible. And so she visits him at the lockup that night and she says to him, you're going to hell for this? You know that, right? I'm just gonna throw it out there, June. I don't think he does. I don't think I do. I'm not sure that the great big G.O.D. is going to see Gary as a terrible human being for doing what he's done. I mean, isn't it all about forgiveness anyway? And if we were going to be compassionate and forgiving, I think this circumstance, as far as Gary getting up to the pearly gates, is probably something we should consider. I don't think that he's going to be going down to hell. I just think that he made maybe an error of judgment and maybe did something that was a little extreme. But the motivation behind it, June, seems to be something that to some degree has legs, we would say. Has legs. There's reasoning behind it. But at the same time, June is obviously somebody who feels that Gary has changed the course of their family life. And I imagine that she was very, very angry. Dosse gets rushed to hospital. Now, legend has it, when you read about this a lot, is that he was shot in such an accurate manner that he was dead before he even hit the ground. Now, in reality, he slipped into a coma and he was pronounced dead the following day. It's ironic as well because Dosse was actually walking past a sign warning against knives, mace and guns when he was shot. Seems ironic and yet it's true. Now, Gary's lawyer, what he does immediately is he has Gary committed to a psychiatric ward. He already is thinking about defence tactics. He wants to portray Gary as a distraught father who believed his son had been sexually abused, that he'd fallen into a deep depression after learning about the abuse. And therefore, what he was saying was that the killing was a justifiable homicide. Again, some people may not even feel that you need to be put in a psychiatric ward to use justifiable homicide as a defence. But at the same time, it would give credence and weight if that individual can be demonstrated to be struggling psychologically or psychiatrically. Now, Gary, who's initially a victim of Dosé's actions, is now facing a second degree murder charge for killing him. But the press get hold of it. And as news of the killing spreads, well, people become really divided. Some people think he's a dangerous vigilante who's murdered a man in cold blood, but some think he's a loving father, driven by rage to just go ahead and kill his son's abuser. The bartender who was actually at the airport where the shooting occurred, they made their feelings really clear. She told the reporters this, I'd have shot him too. If he'd done what they say he's done to my boys, only I'd a gun shot him three or four times and he'd have suffered before he died. There's something about a mother's vitriol that I find compelling because Gary shot that guy once and here we have this woman saying, if that was my kid, I would literally have made sure he was tortured before ultimately I killed him. Now the extent of abuse that Jodie had suffered at Dosse's hands came out during the preparations for the trial and it was established that Dosse had been abusing that little boy for over a year. That's just horrific. That poor child was dealing with that horrendous abuse for such a long time. And he was just remaining silent because 
he didn't know how to manage the loyalty he felt to his abuser. So as these findings are coming out, it helps to bolster Gary's case. And also a Baton Rouge officer described Dursay at the time. He said, he was a classic paedophile. They seek out the type of situation where they can be involved closely on a frequent basis with kids, but they are different than rapists who hate their victims in that they love their victims. Now, again, I would actually take some issue with the description of them being a classic paedophile because what the officer is arguing there is that whereas a rapist will go out and brutally rape because they're dealing with power and domination, it's less sexually motivated, it's more about completely controlling the victim. He's saying that a paedophile is a classic paedophile actually loves the child and therefore feels that the sex that is occurring between the child and them is not something that's forced, but it's wrong. And the officer is wrong in describing it this way. It's absolutely forced. The child can't consent. They do not know how to consent. They do not understand sex. And therefore they cannot in any way, shape or form be in a consenting partnership. And the power balance is so off that just like with a rapist, there is still domination within this crime. It is the distortion that the actual paedophile is using in their own mind that enables them to feel that they have a legitimate relationship with this child. And they don't love their victims at all. They use their victims. They have such a distorted perspective about what's acceptable that they can abuse them without feeling guilt. So I believe that rapists and paedophiles are in the same category and paedophiles are actually worse when they are offending because they are affecting children. Now, ultimately, there is a plea deal that's reached with the prosecutors. So instead of Gary being charged with second degree murder, he made an uncontested plea to manslaughter, which makes sense. There was a motivation emotionally behind his actions. And was he thinking clearly in the way that you would for premeditated murder? Some would say yes, some would say, well, actually, no. If it went to court, often a jury would probably find that the way that Gary had acted would not fit first degree or second degree murder. Now, during the sentencing phase, Gary's attorney did actually try to argue that he was in a temporary psychotic state when he killed Dose. And the psychological reports that were drawn up, they concluded that Gary basically couldn't tell the difference between right and wrong at the time of the killing, that he believed in that moment what he was doing was right, that he had a God-given right to protect his family. And furthermore, reports concluded that Dose had indeed acted in a highly manipulative manner. He'd taken advantage of Gary's family, the vulnerability and the breakup and that he'd used that as an opportunity to weave himself into the family. So Gary was operating from a really challenging psychological position where he felt like this man had infiltrated everything good within his world and had destroyed so much of it. Because of that, he felt that he had to act in this way. Now, Gary was ultimately sentenced to seven years. A lot of you may take a sharp intake of breath and be like, whoa, wait a minute. This is a man who genuinely was acting from a place of care and compassion. Even though a man was murdered in this situation, this man was not actually a killer. He was reacting to something that was unholy in his world. He was reacting to something that he couldn't bear psychologically and emotionally to witness as far as this individual being given an opportunity to potentially walk free one day after he destroyed his family, impacted on his child's life. So a lot of people would think that seven years is too long. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's no time at all. This guy actually killed somebody. He seemed to be premeditated. He had a weapon. He seemed cool, calm and collected when it carried out the killing. Seven years is nothing. But whichever way you fall on that, that seven years was actually suspended. So it meant that he'd never serve a day in prison. And the reason that the judge allowed him to walk free with that suspended sentence was they said, Gary's not a risk to society. He's not somebody who is murderous. He's not somebody who wants to harm others. This was a completely unique scenario that he found himself in that won't be repeated because it's highly unlikely another man is going to walk into Gary's children's lives and harm them in this way. So the judge believed that the cost of incarcerating him, it wasn't worth it. 
there'd be nothing achieved by doing so. Now, he also got five years probation and he also had to undertake 300 hours of community service, which he duly completed and complied with. Most of that, it was at his local church, cutting grass. One of the things that I think is really interesting about Gary is that he never, ever displayed any remorse for the shooting. Not once. He genuinely felt what he did was right. When he was 67, he was interviewed again and he just made it clear, I'd do exactly the same again. In fact, he stated words to the effect of, if it was your son who was sexually abused by that pervert, you would have done exactly the same thing I did, given the opportunity. I genuinely relate to that as a parent. I do genuinely relate to it. Often when I've got involved with my own children, and conversed with them about my feelings and the same with my husband, I say there are very few crimes that I would happily go to prison for smiling. But if somebody killed or sexually harmed my child, I think that I would do that. It's something visceral, cerebral, instinctual, animal based, I don't know, the primordial being, the maternal, but whatever it is, I feel I can relate so much to what you would consider a justified killing, even though we know that really there is no such thing. It's just something about wanting to protect your children. Following that interview, the year after Gary actually died, so he died on the 21st of October 2014, and he died from complications from a stroke which had been caused by diabetes. Now, let's remember the victim in this case. So Jody, of course, and he was the victim all the way through this. This is a child who was molested. It was a child who witnessed his father kill somebody, essentially. It was a child who had to deal with the ramifications and fallout of that. He said, I think for a lot of people who've not been satisfied by the American justice system, my dad stands as a symbol of justice. My dad did what everybody says they would do. Yet only a few have done it. Plus, he didn't go to jail. That said, I cannot and will not condone his behavior. I understand why he did it, but it's more important for a parent to be there to help support their child than to put themselves in a place to be prosecuted. So interesting, isn't it, seeing the child's perspective of that. So whilst I completely identify with Gary, it's true what Jody is saying. If his father had been locked away for 20 years, Jody would have been denied that person in his life. So he feels angry with the fact that his father risked that. He sees his father's actions as protective on one level, but egocentric on another. It was about him. It was about him dealing with his feelings. Yes, he's saying that he was doing it to protect his child, but arguably his child sees that he was doing it because he was being selfish. He couldn't manage those difficult feelings. So he decided to kill because of those feelings, thus leaving the family to pick up the pieces. And it makes sense. It's interesting to see how Jody sees that situation. Because of course, to some degree, his father comes across as a hero. But in doing so, it could have meant that Jodie didn't have a father around. In August 2019, Jodie actually released a book. He's 46 at this point, And the book was called Why Gary Why? The Jodie Ploche Story. At the time of the shooting, Jodie said he was really angry with his father. One, he didn't want to say dead. Yeah, he wanted him to stop. He wanted him to go to jail. And he'd actually purposely not told his father about the abuse because he did feel that there was a strong possibility if he told his dad that his father would go ahead and kill his abuser. Now, Jody went on with his life to work at a victim services centre. He worked as a sexual assault counsellor and prevention educator. His work basically involved teaching parents how to reduce risks from paedophiles. And ultimately, he became the supervisor of community education programmes. So... He spent his life dedicated to protecting children. It's interesting that his father had one way of believing he was protecting children, whereas Jody felt that there was a much longer term solution to doing that, which is how he's devoted his life. This has been a really unique case because the overwhelming majority of the public seem to side with Gary. Many people state that they'd have done the same, but I guess we can say that but when it actually comes down to pulling the trigger, would we really? I mean, he was a Marine. 
So arguably he was an individual who was taught to be willing to stand up in moments where protection is required and maybe he was more trained because of that. But can we genuinely say as human beings that we would be an individual who could go ahead and do what Gary did? So if I'm playing devil's advocate, we've got to remember that at the point that he killed Dose, he was technically still an innocent man. He hadn't been tried. So that says, was he innocent until proven guilty? I mean, I completely understand why Gary did what he did, but I guess we also always need to be aware that we've got to be careful about condoning vigilante justice because it's a murky area, it's a slippery slope. And the reason for that is you have to ask yourself, at one point does it become inexcusable to take the law into your own hands? You know, to right a perceived wrong. At the end of the day, you have to be clear on that, don't you? There is the law... And if you act outside of the law, no matter what your reasoning behind that, you therefore have broken the law. And it's a really murky area when vigilante behaviour plays out, even when they believe that it's for the moral high ground. An assistant prosecutor at the time posed this philosophical question, so to speak. They said, the dilemma is this. If we say that what he did isn't wrong, do we open the door for the husband of a rape victim or the mother of a murdered child to do the same thing? Do we declare open season on child molesters, then rapists, then burglars? If the grand jury says, Gary, what you did is forgivable, what do we do about the next victim's revenge? Where do you draw the line? I think that's an important statement to make. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, we have to ask, was Gary a dangerous vigilante? Or was he actually a father protecting his family? Well, I suppose there's even a third possibility. So some claim that Gary's motivation for killing Dose was primarily jealousy-based. So June's divorce lawyer described Gary as a possessive individual. He was apparently prone to jealous outbursts. He knew that June was sleeping with Dose. And Dose's family, following his actual death, they alleged that there'd been a massive smear campaign against him. They said that Gary used his high-ranking police contacts to basically frame him, that he wanted revenge for his relationship with June. And they also claimed that Dose, when questioned, genuinely denied any abuse of Jody or any child, in fact. And all of the neighbours that knew him claimed that Dose was a really good guy. Apparently dated girls in the area, was a bit of a ladies' man, and they refused point blank to believe any allegations against him. Who knows what the truth is? Whilst he wasn't tried and actually found guilty, Dosey's actions do appear highly incriminating. I mean, the rape kit, the test that they did on Jodie, that in itself is incriminating. Now, it could be well the case that Gary did kill Dosey in both a jealous and fatherly rage. I mean, discovering that your spouse is sleeping with your kid's karate instructor shortly after your breakup is a pretty triggering experience, but discovering that he's also raped your 11-year-old son? I mean, who knows what you'd be capable of in those moments? We do clearly know what Gary was capable of. That can most definitely be stated, can't it? So whilst I cannot quantify whether I or you would do it, we absolutely know that in certain cases, certainly in Gary's case, that's exactly what played out. Who knows what the truth is in reality, but whilst Dose wasn't tried and wasn't therefore found guilty, the actions that he took were highly incriminating, as were the results of the rape kit on Jodie. So Of course, it could well be the case that Gary killed Dose in both a jealous and fatherly rage. You know, discovering that your spouse is sleeping with your kid's karate instructor shortly after you've broken up, that will be tough. Then discovering he's also raped your 11-year-old son? I mean, who knows what someone, any of us in fact, could be capable of? Though we clearly know exactly what Gary was capable of. I wonder what you think about this particular case, whether you believe it was justified and the actions that led to Dossé's death were absolutely deserved, 
or whether you feel that Gary acted inappropriately and that his punishment maybe wasn't acceptable, or whether you believe that he should have received the sentence he was given and shouldn't have served time in prison, and therefore it was appropriate the way that justice was doled out. What we have to remember at the end of this is the one victim in all of this is Jody. Jody's life was horribly affected and his relationship with his father impacted. And he had to manage all of those challenging feelings that children have to manage when they care deeply for the person who's harming them. In this case, Jodie was a loving, compassionate child who trusted an individual who he believed had his best interests at heart. And even when that individual crossed the boundaries and started to harm him in hideous ways, he still cared about their relationship. That is so, so the case with millions of children who encounter this kind of abuse, the conflict they experience because they feel loyal. And even though things are happening to them that are so wrong and feel so bad, because the person has built a relationship with them and because a lot of that relationship feels good, it means that they accept these horrendous reasonable behaviors for fear of letting them down. So Jody is the only person in this case, really, that is the true victim as far as I'm concerned. Gary made his choices, Dose made his choices, but Jody, he was a victim, he was powerless, and what happened to him is something that I think a lot of us will relate to, and it's great to know that he's somebody who's gone out of his way now to create a life where he makes a difference to children and to parents and for the protection of those individuals. It says something powerful about Jodie's mindset. Thanks for joining me. Give me a comment, give me a like, get involved with the chat, let me know your thoughts. And I know that a lot of you who've been through these issues will really relate to Jodie's experience. I know that a lot of you parents who've had children who've been impacted by these things will also relate. And I would love to know your thoughts. See you again. Take care guys, be safe.